Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I'm of the stars on this chilly December day and I'm doing a reading of uh, Revelation of St. John the Divine, chapter 9. And like the last chapter, I've been putting it off for a while. And this has to do with the gnarly content of the chapter. So before I start on chapter 9, um, which talks about the tribulations of the end days, the days that actually are past, but that we're um, clearing through in, the, in our electromagnetic fields as quickly as we can in flocks of people that intertwine and depart from each other like flocks of beautiful birds in the sky, some rising higher, faster, and some taking their time going up. So um, this is all happening in a sort of a, a well-planned, staggered fashion on Earth today, Earth having already ascended. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to read chapter 9 for, and, and describe a little from the ascension point of view, but first I want to read the, read the last verse of the preceding chapter, chapter 8, because it pertains to chapter 9. And it goes like this. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So this, um, this angel is predicting suffering three times, three kinds of suffering. Woe, 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 right? Meaning suffering. And chapter 9, as I read it, uh, describes two woes, two of the three woes, okay? Three of the things that, that, would, um, that would cause, say, that would test the faith of a Christian and and help the Christian to become more truly um, aligned with the consciousness of Christ. So that's a good part about these woes is that they're really there to help the soul to quickly achieve Christ consciousness, I feel. <sighs> Chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. All right, so... At this point, I'd like to pause for a minute and talk about those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Okay. Um, there is a pertinent Bible verse that has to do with the eye being single. It's a statement of Christ, I believe, uh, the eye being single. And um, the idea there, as I understand it, from yogic lore is that is the same as the seal of God in the forehead or can be. It has to do with the third eye point of yoga and it has to do uh, with the with the development of the pineal and pituitary glands in the center of the head right back here in the center of the head though and their clearing and cleansing, which can take place through diet and yoga and all kinds of things. 
when these two glands are completely clear and functioning optimally, then, then a person could be said to have the seal of God in their forehead because the, um, these glands help to bring in God's light into the physical form from the other dimensions, you see. So, so the question is, what happens to people whose pituitary and pineal glands are not properly balanced? And we're about to hear what might happen. This, I, I would say, take, in, um, take as a warning to try and get your endocrine system working optimally for this transition to the fifth dimension. So, it sounds a little a little bit scary and so here we go so we're talking about the locus and this is the description and to them it was given that they should not kill them that's these people who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And I'd like to stop right there and, and for pause for a moment and say, it seems to me what's being said there is that it will only take five months to balance the endocrine system but that not having it balanced will, um, will cause despair. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So these days, whatever the cause, uh, there is a chance that we will feel despair. And as you know, the only antidote to despair is faith. And, well... Two antidotes, faith and hope in God. Okay, so should you experience despair, use the exercises that you'll find in the blog to balance your endocrine system, decalcify your pineal gland and so forth, your, um, build your pituitary gland to the point where it can, um, it can hold uh, God's light and wisdom and direct your, your life and help you to help others to be guided in the same way okay so the warning sign here the warning sign of the of the locust event is despair and i'll continue on now I, and i'm warning any young people who are listening it does get a little bit more scary right here and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So, so this description, it would drive anyone to despair, wouldn't it? Um... They were mighty like horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were like crowns of gold, so they were regal, and their faces were as the faces of men, which is an unusual thing that a locust should have, uh, an awe-inspiring thing that a locust should have the face of a man. And then their hair is the hair of women, so their teeth as the teeth of lions. So they had, they had three qualities. They were like men, they were like women, and they were very um, like fierce and cruel, 
like lions. This reminds me this reminds me of the recent uh, work that I've done on pack behavior and feral instincts. Um, I wonder if, if there is here the uncovering of the, of the most um, ancient memories of the human race and the, the place where we were almost like animals or even the... Um, even the memories of animals on planet Earth that we might be clearing through for the animal realm and for Earth. The ideas of, of predator and prey, the ideas of preying on other members of the human species, for instance. Um, so we might be facing this idea of cruelty that is, could be in both men and women and overcoming this despair through Christ consciousness. That's one thought. I'll read that part again. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So you have the notion of men and women being very cruel, right? Which is the idea behind what I just was talking about. All right, now to go on. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Okay, so in a way this is a good thing, that all these um, scary qualities of these scorpions could only hurt men five months. So if you're right now going through, say, the valley of, of fear of death and despair and like that, as a result of the ascension process, you could look to these words and say, this is going to be temporary. I can trust in God and trust in Christ that I will get through this. That's my thought about the five months. Now to go on. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Um, I have read that this Abaddon, or Apollyon, is one way of saying Satan, one way of describing Satan as the angel of the bottomless pit. Say the bottomless pit of despair, right? All right, now. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So, the sixth angel. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. So now what we have here with the sixth angel sounding is a prophecy that a third of the people will be slain. I have a little bit of a different notion about this than most people. My idea is not that of people being killed, although it may happen that there are more deaths in this time frame, because some souls just feel that they have had enough. Ascension is a very difficult process. 
and they decide in conjunction with their guardian angels that it is time for them to go and that they can do better work or more work on the astral plane. That has happened to a number of very good, very dedicated people who have shown the way and led the way for many that they have passed on since the shift in 2012. Also, I think that there is an issue here of continuing to clear through the vital drives, the gut brain, and uniting it with the pineal gland energy and the pituitary gland energy through the energy of the heart. It is possible that some people will run amok. For instance, the other day I noticed some stories on the internet regarding mass murders or serial killings and that kind of thing. It is possible that there will be more violence during this time, as many people just do not know what is going on. And so they will feel an increase in the energy of their lower chakras. Now what is that about, that energy of the lower chakras? It is a very important energy for us because it keeps us here on planet Earth. It keeps us grounded and engaged in daily life. And one of the most important goals of the Ascension process is for us to maintain physical form on Earth and do our work on Earth our service for Earth, and at the same time embody the higher consciousness of Christ, you see, even to the angelic realm and higher, and to allow this energy to exist along with the very grounded state that the human physical form has been in on Earth. So these lower three chakras that form the lower triangle are very important to us as human beings. But the state of dense energy that duality is in right now in the third dimension allows people to act out these scenarios of violence if they are not aware enough through their heart chakra of what is going on. If they cannot feel compassion for other people, for instance, if they cannot link in with that beautiful grace of God, then what can happen with the lower chakras is that they can go with various unfortunate scenarios. The lowest chakra, for instance, could go with scenarios of killing. The next chakra, the second or sexual, could go with scenarios of rape. The next chakra, the third, the navel point energy, could go with scenarios of wanting to control the world, however that might manifest. That acting out would not be something experienced by the majority of people, but some people might feel driven to act out these sorts of violent scenarios during this quick upgrade process that is taking place. So this is a warning to us, according to my interpretation. Please do not act out. If you feel in danger of acting out, seek help, seek counsel, spiritual or medical counsel. Go to church and sit in the church. That will help a lot or just sit down for a while and feel your heart or feel your lungs breathing or do some stretching or do something really good for yourself. Rather than acting on impulse in an unusual way during this situation. I have two more thoughts about the sixth trumpet, the horsemen and the horses. The first thought, in addition to the interpretation about the lower triangle, is that this might be a description of fear, especially fear of change that is killing people. 
And then the other thing that I have to add has to do with Hindu texts. And that is a description of the wild horses of the senses. It could be that lack of introspection, lack of meditation and contemplation could lead us astray because then we will be pulled hither and thither by the wild horses of the senses. There will be no leader in charge. The ascension conscious, aware mind will not be in charge. This might also apply to the astral senses because so many people are becoming clear now. And the wild horsemen described in the Bible might be construed as negative astral entities discerned by the clear senses, entities that pull us into realms that create fear for us. So maybe the sixth trumpet might be descrying fear of change or the distraction of sense objects. If we could avoid these obstacles, we could go with that faith and hope and trust in God instead. Along those lines, the people that are very experienced with ascension say that if instead of fear we feel any positive emotion, such as gratitude or appreciation, that will put us in a totally different dynamic with regard to this dimension. It will lift us into a higher dimension so that we are unscathed by these fierce horsemen or by these locusts, so that we can get safely through this process. Let me go on now with verses 18 and 19, describing the horses. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. In terms of the human chakras, the chakras of the human electromagnetic field, if the mouth is considered to be the fifth chakra, the throat which, through which we speak. And if the tail is considered to be the second chakra, the sexual chakra, or perhaps the first chakra, the basal chakra, or the two combined, then we could get a picture of a person who has a lot to say in terms of damning other people, in terms of judging other people. Uh, that's the notion of fire and smoke and brimstone. And who is, at the same time, very sexual or very interested in surviving himself or herself, um, and whose heart chakra is not the main feature of their electromagnetic field. Uh, so, so this description of these horses implies that people whose electromagnetic fields are modeled in this manner with emphasis on the fifth chakra, the th throat chakra, and perhaps the first or second chakra, the tail or bottom part of the electromagnetic field, and which lack relative strength of heart energy are are more like fearsome horses than like human beings. Um, 
The Bible makes a distinction between these horses and the people that are ascending. They are the obstacle to the people who are ascending. The description also has to do with the demonic realm um, on which these people's electromagnetic field is modeled or through which it is distorted as the demon realm has no heart energy. It relies on speaking on the astral plane, the types of hurtful malware and mouthspeak that will distort the human energy field away from the basic uh, emotion and energy of love. And that then emphasizes the sexual energy uh, to the exclusion of heartfelt affection, gratitude, and appreciation. So, so in that context, in my context, uh, I would say that it's good to, to balance out all of the chakric energies in the electromagnetic field if one wishes to ascend, rather than concentrated on that hellfire and brimstone way of talking or thinking. That's, that's another way of looking at these, these horses of the sixth trumpet. The last two verses are very important because they represent the things that we need to overcome in order to complete the ascension process. So now, the penultimate, or next to the last verse. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. There are two admonitions here, as I understand it. We must not worship devils, and we must not worship idols, which are the insensate works of our hands. This verse speaks directly to the plague of materialism now upon the earth. And it says, turn to spirit, turn to God, and let that carry us through. These other things, these are not going to do it. There's not a chance that anything that God made is going to see us through the great unknown that we are now stepping into. We can have things, but we cannot anticipate that they will give us faith or that they will give us hope or trust. The juxtaposition of devils and idols in this verse leads me to guess that the demonic realm depends on object identification identification of heart's desire with objects in the material world so as to drag down human beings into states of awareness termed by Christianity the hell worlds and the purgatory worlds of the fourth dimension. Whether these be while in form or after passing on, I feel. The demonic realm by my light is the exact opposite of the state of awareness of those human beings now choosing to experience ascension. Those who so choose are beginning to experience the heaven worlds of the fourth dimension and higher, the fifth dimension, buddhic and Christed awareness, and even less dense states of awareness in the sixth through the twelfth formed dimensions. And now the very last verse. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. This verse represents a list of the things that we need to do in order to safely ascend. We must avoid murdering we must not participate in sorcery. 
that is to say, black magic. We must not participate in fornication. We must not steal, not engage in theft. I consider these to be a very important part of this chapter, and I am going to address them one by one. So now murder. It seems like I've done a lot of talking lately on the blog regarding murder. And uh, in terms of, for instance, the most blatant examples of serial killing and mass murder and that kind of thing. So what I think I'll do here is, is give you a link to the blog where you can search for those and get a notion about it. Uh, just that there seems to be quite a trend in the direction of violence and uh, probably spurred on by the mass media. So I would suggest turning off the television set and avoiding the mass media during this time because they incite the subconscious mind to violence. So that's my thought on the admonition not to murder. <laughs> I've talked some about, um, in some of the blogs, about black magic quite recently and the need to align with God's will, God's heart, and uh, God's mind instead of aligning with the lesser power of Satan. And so I think I'll just refer you to that blog here rather than repeating myself. <laughs> so. <laughs> so let's see. So I thought I'd just, um, just say a little something about the admonition against fornication here uh, and, and what could God have been thinking of through St. John the Divine, right? Because here in America today, fornication is a way of life and people don't think much about one way or the other. It's greatly advocated on the mass media and it's assumed that if you're well-adjusted, you're able to do this, right? called hooking up in the in the young terms and uh, I think that overall most age brackets these days have, have pretty much um, loosened up regarding the restrictions against fornication at least in the United States right so so if our way of life is appropriate and true what has God been thinking about to ad admonish us not to fornicate, right? What is this about? Well, I have a purely scientific point of view for you regarding this, and it has to do with the electromagnetic field, right? And, and entanglements with the dark, and entanglements with the um, soul wounding of other people, which is ex expressing itself as distortions of our field of light, right? What happens when we fornicate is that our, our um, etheric net, our electromagnetic field, and our body of light all become somewhat entangled with that of another person. And um, if this is a severe like entanglement, there are psychic cords also that bind us to someone else, something like tethers, like the other person is a tether ball and say if they're a woman or a man doesn't matter and if we are the the pole and be between the ball and the pole there is a tether right you could take turns being the ball and the pole <laughs> and what happens is whatever movement the ball makes also influences the pole and whatever in whatever movement the pole makes influences the ball so we're no longer one person in standing alone in the grace of God and descending. What we are is a tether, tether ball or a tether ball pole, you see. And it takes time to work our way out of these entanglements. If we entangle ourselves even all at one time with six different people or five different people, then we have quite a complicated quantum arrangement to deal with. And we have, it will take us effort and awareness and great concentration to extricate ourselves from the dark enmeshment that, uh, that occurs during the very um, stridently strong act of, of sex, you see. 
ah, oh, it's not so bad with one other person, actually. It settles down, you know, after a while, and, and people pretty much can can feel their own hearts and, and the heart of the other person when they're with them especially, and then pull back into their own electromagnetic field when that person is not closely around, you see. So that's, that's from my point of view, the admonition against fornication has to do with the need to um, conserve and, and um, perfect our own electromagnetic field so that we can uh, um, uh, safely and happily go through the the increasingly s strong light that's occurring here on earth, the, the greater and greater grace of Christ's consciousness. What with the great telepathy that all people are encountering right now, everybody knows everybody's secret information about their finances and their credit cards and so forth. And pretty soon they're going to be finding on earth that that there are like people who are clearing through um, the um, prenatal tendencies of avarice or greed and who are going into the internet and into the banks and so forth and and pretty much making a making a, a big mess with the financial system you see and and there's going to come a time when everyone on earth, quite soon, when everyone on earth gets together and takes the kind of action that is needed as a world community to solve the question, how is it going to be that everyone has enough to eat? How is it going to be that everyone has a place to, uh, to, to live, has shelter, and has medical um, care for them, themselves. How is it going to be that everyone on earth has, has clean water to drink? How are these needs going to be satisfied? And how are we going to address these, these residual issues of the um, samskaras of avarice and greed? So I want you to know that it's all going to happen like a miracle all at once, like the unfolding of a great understanding in the world community. So when, it, when and if you come to the understanding that, that nothing in life is secure, that your property is not secure, that your earning ability may not be secure, that there are many people who have no food, no water, and who are dying for, for lack of medical care, and you wonder... How are these problems going to be solved? I would like you to know that the solutions for the global community are just around the corner and will be achieved through the blessing of our own hearts. Our hearts will do it. So, fall not into despair. Let not the lower chakras engage you in violent action in the world. As everything changes, grasp faith and hope and trust in God and in Christ consciousness. Let go the insufficient security of materialism, of money, of fooling around to try to forget about the problem. <laughs> Ask for counsel. Ask for help from, from your friends and from professionals and from the community ask for help help will be there ask god for help and for heaven's sake don't turn to black magic as a means of achieving power and turning downward towards the earth instead of turning outward to th to the divine compassion and the divine love okay well, that's how I'm reading all this right now. I will say that St. John the Divine had quite a flair for describing things. And so the next person that comes along will have a, a, quite a different idea about this, no doubt. And I would say that everybody's point of view is, is really welcome in this story about the unfolding of new life on new earth. 
So now I'd like to recap this chapter, which is very important. Uh, the, with the fifth angel sounding, what we have is, for whatever reason, described as seriously scary locusts in this chapter, people fall into despair. Okay? And next we have, with the sixth angel sounding, we have people being very afraid, even dying of fear. Okay. And then at the very end of the chapter, we have a number of caveats, things that we should not do, things that we should avoid in order to ascend. Okay. So that's the great wisdom and learning to be had from this chapter. I'll take care until next we meet.